going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. I think there have always been people out there that have been willing to shoot and kill people. Certainly people out there that have always been willing to shoot and kill police officers. We can walk across the street and see the names of more than 100 police officers that have been killed. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Early Wednesday morning, Dante Person shot Cincinnati Police Officer Christina Holtman in the face. For the third time in six weeks, police officers have been shot, leaving the community with two questions. Why and what can be done? To talk about those questions, I'm joined this morning by Cecil Thomas, newly elected member of the Cincinnati City Council. Before joining council, Mr. Thomas served 27 years as a Cincinnati police officer. After retiring in 2000, he became the executive director of the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission, and he now serves as the head or the chair of council's Law and Public Safety Committee. Cecil, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thank you, Dan. As a police officer for 27 years, what happens if you're on duty when an incident like this takes place? Oh. What happens to you as a person? Well, you know, um, it's interesting you'd ask that question because I've I easily identified with uh, uh, the young lady's, the young officer's situation. The first thing happens to you is there's an emotional rush of adrenaline that goes through your, your mind. Uh, as an officer, when you hear one of your fellow officers scream in the radio, uh, you're working, you hear the scream, you hear the officer say, officer shot, officer down, you, you, you really start to, you, you get this real sick feeling because you can't do anything because you don't know where that officer's at. So you're sitting and you're waiting and, and, and you're, 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 you're determined to say, I got to get wherever she's at. And uh, uh, so you get this, this rush and then you hear that the officer is location. Immediately you respond uh, because you want to get there it's simply because you, you feel it's a member of your family, so to speak, that's, that's uh, in danger. But once you get there and, every, and, and you realize the situation, if it's an officer shot, whatever the case, you get a real, real sick feeling inside you know after you've gotten everything under control it, and and I can't really explain it but it's the emotional adrenaline starts to you know subside and you really start to feel sick. Have you had an occasion to be early on the scene oh, of an officer man. shot? Yeah and and I back in 1974-75 uh, I hadn't been on but a year or two <clears throat> when officer Bill Lofton was killed on Bernard Avenue and the run came out, uh, my partner and I were sitting at the corner of uh, Rockdale and Reading Road, and all we heard was the officer uh, screaming that uh, his partner had been shot, uh, officer down, and we, he did not give the location. We, all we heard was uh, the dispatcher saying, what's your location, what's your location? And I'm, uh, oh man, you just don't know what I was feeling. Uh, finally, we heard Star Service Station. Immediately, we knew then it was Bernard Avenue. Uh, so I, we responded over there uh, from Rockdale and Burnett, from Rockdale and Reading, and there the officer was lying in the street, and his partner, the partner was trying to uh, deal with the crowd. You've seen the tapes for this incident. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the way these two officers responded to the situation? I commend those officers. I commend the training that our officers are receiving. I commend the chief of police. I commend the training academy. Those officers did exactly, uh, responded exactly how they were trained. Uh, when I listened to this tape, when I saw the tape, when the shots rang out and the scream, the partner, you saw the partner immediately uh, moved to take cover. She moved out of the camera on the uh, uh, engine side of the, uh, of the vehicle, the police vehicle. That's what she's, they're trained to do, take cover and then assess the situation. Uh, the officer immediately assessed the situation and uh, then immediately responded to the aid of her partner after she determined exactly what was going on. That is what they're trained to do. The other officer immediately uh, 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 indicated that she had been shot. Uh, she was able to return fire during a, you know, a, a very difficult, stressful situation. They're trained to do that. It reminds me of, of Katie Conway and how even though she had been shot several times, uh, she was able to uh, do what she was trained to do, which was to uh, 
get control of that. You keep right. saying, but I want to make sure you keep saying training. Mm -hmm. Those sorts of responses occur because of training, not because of instinct. Well, the the, the training uh, enhances the instinct, and let's put it that way. You know, and it's a natural instinct to try to protect yourself. That's that's natural, but it's it's when your adrenaline's flowing, when the when the spur of the incident occurs so quickly, it really causes you to uh, have to uh, maintain some level of calm, even under fire. Some people want to say that police officers right now feel constrained because of the collaborative agreement, that they're not doing what they need to do to protect themselves, they're not being as aggressive as they could be. Is that an issue? Well, you will hear a lot of that from officers on the streets. Uh, uh, however, uh, I look at it from the standpoint of the collaborative agreement is a partnership between citizens and police. And uh, some would argue that, well, some segments of the citizens community is not doing their job. This is why you know, folks aren't turning folks in and things of this nature. Others will say, well, the police aren't doing all of what they could do. The fact of the matter is, 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 is that if an officer, we don't want our officers to feel constrained by anything. I don't think that the collaborative is an actual restraint. I think what it is is a perception uh, that uh, uh, everybody's not doing their part. It, 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 and, and when an officer gets these kinds of frivolous complaints, which are somewhat a result of the collaborative, it makes them say, well, is it really worth it to go out here and do that extra? You know, and uh, what, what I want officers to understand is, is that um, just do your job. Go out and do your job. I'll, as the head of law and public safety, if citizens have complaints, I'll take the complaints and I'll look at it. I, I'm a former officer. I can assess whether that complaint is a legitimate complaint. And uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, part of that collaborative agreement, as you were just saying, is that many different aspects of the community, never d many different people, many different organizations, mm -hmm. have responsibilities. It's not just the police. Right, exactly. So given where we are right now, let's talk about a couple of things here. Mm -hmm. What's the responsibility, uh, I'm going to raise a couple sure. of different groups. Sure. What about the responsibility of parents? Because most of these <coughs> shootings involve young people. Well, clearly we got a very serious problem uh, of, of uh, proper parent parental responsibility. You know, I, I, you hear me all the time say, well, where are the parents in this situation? Uh, but again, though, what can we do to uh, uh, deal with that situation? Parents aren't, aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Now what does the police do? They have to be the parent. You know, and, and we, wanna, we don't want that to be the, the case. So the community has to step up. So what do we do? Uh, w as the collaborative agreement calls for, the community has to get involved in the overall social ears of our, our community. Community being through organizations well, that already exist, or do we need something different, or what do we do? Organizations that already exist. The Police Partnering Center, the uh, Community mm -hmm. Police Partnering Center, that is the mechanism by which uh, the community can be directed as to what they can do. This is why it's so critically important that neighborhood community councils open their doors fully to the, to the uh, community police partnering and CPOP, you know. Uh, that is the mechanism. Okay. Let's talk about some other groups, organizations. What about schools? Schools, education, let's be real, you know. Schools in terms of of, of working uh, in conjunction with the uh, community and working in conjunction, in conjunction with the police. You know, schools are a, a mechanism by which a lot of things take place, you know, that uh, 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 start in the school and spill over into the neighborhood. You know, uh, a parent moves from one uh, area of the, of, the, of the city to another area. The young man gets into disputes and before you know it, you've got all kinds of stuff taking place. In relationship to schools, relationship to neighborhoods, and you get different answers at different times mm -hmm. on this. Do we have a gang issue here? What we got is uh, loosely uh, organized kids from neighborhoods. Uh, and it's, it's not that many uh, neighborhoods. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about five or six neighborhoods Name at the em. most. 
no, nah, nah, I don't want to do that because then that, that gives them where they think, okay, yeah, you know, it gives them some type of, of, uh, uh, of identity or whatever. I don't want them to start okay. romanticizing. All right. But the fact of the matter is these loosely knit uh, groups of kids uh, is something that we've had for many years. The only difference now is that because of the availability of firearms, uh, that has really created a major problem for our police, but it's going to take an effort of the citizens and the police to deal with that. What do we do about firearms? They seem to be, in these situations, it seems to be omnipresent. It seems mm -hmm. like lots of people are carrying firearms out there. Well, there's two things we can do. From, from a law enforcement stand, uh, standpoint, we can aggressively uh, uh, patrol uh, to uh, uh, be very innovative in the way we, 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 we make our traffic stops and things. For example, this latest incident where the young uh, officer was shot, uh, that was an aggressive patrol. An officer saw a vehicle that uh, had tinted windows had, uh, that were more tinted than, than the, mm -hmm. the rules apply. Uh, license plate wa light was out. The officer pulled the vehicle over. The driver did have a traffic, uh, some type of warrant. I don't know if it was traffic, but it had a warrant. Now, based on that, now you have uh, problem calls to search that vehicle. Now, in this particular case, uh, so just so happened there was another indiv individual in the car with a firearm. If that was just one individual and there was a firearm in the car, you still would have had an opportunity to, to. Uh, in the police officers' minds right now, is every traffic stop, every interaction potentially this kind of incident? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're trained to think that. You see, you don't want to let your guard down uh, just because it does not look like a potential situation. Every traffic stop, uh, every potential encounter can be a deadly encounter at some point. One other group that I want to raise here is what about the media? What's our responsibility and are what we do, the way we cover things, are we being responsible or should things change? No, I think the media should uh, get the information. For instance, in this last shooting incident, uh, just get out the facts. You know, when you, when you come to the press conference, Put the facts out based on the press conference. Put the facts out on what someone said. You know, uh, just be responsible. Yeah, you know, and, and and that's all we can ask from the media, because you all are uh, uh, you're the tool to inform the public. Let me, but I, I want to raise this. I, I want to push on this a little mm -hmm. bit, because we do so much crime reporting mm -hmm. on our news. On the one hand, do we? give that a romantic feel? Do people, does that matter to those young kids out there that they might get covered on TV? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, are we creating more concern and panic among people th th than there really needs to be? Well, I, I do believe that the, the, the majority of the citizens of Cincinnati realize that we've got a serious crisis uh, as it relates to gun violence and, and uh, violence in, in general. Uh, but I also believe that a, a very impactful way for the media to, to, to affect this problem is when, for instance, there was a re the, the individual that was given 39 years for the situation up in uh, Price Hill. Mm -hmm. That had a, a dramatic effect. A young man came up to me. I was pumping gas. Uh, he came up to me. After that, he said, Mr. Thomas, I saw you on TV, blah, blah, blah. He said, my, 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 that was my partner that got 39 years. He said, I can't do 39 years. And, that's, and he was very sincere. He said, I can do eight, but I can't do 39. That's the kind of impactful, uh, even though you may not know it's having an impact, an impact, it really has. We need to send that kind of message. And, and I feel very strongly that uh, uh, because of the, the incidents with the jails, the problems with not having jail space. A lot of those young men don't believe that they can. One last area, because we're going to be running out of time here, but one last area. You've been very upfront in the last few days about, mm -hmm. hey, yeah. if people shoot at police <coughs> officers, police officers are going to shoot back. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Are you getting people who are telling you that that's too strong a language? Well, you, you, you're going to have folks to say that. You know, and, and, and yes, I have had people saying, well, we need to pull back. You, need, you, you really shouldn't be so, so, so outspoken like that. And, and, and I do understand the concern. You know, however, and, and, and I, you know, I don't want to say that, <laughs> that I'm going to continue to speak that way. No, what I'm, I'll tone down. But the message is clear, and I think the majority of people understand it, is that law, lawlessness is not going to be tolerated in our city. It's just that simple. And common sense will tell anybody that if, if you shoot at somebody, you know, <laughs> all kind of things can happen. Uh, but my point is, is that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, what I want citizens to understand is the collaborative agreement, this is the most, our citizens should be outraged. And the collaborative agreement calls for citizens and police to work together. This is the most opportune time to put that to action. So the, your, your message is we all need to be active. Absolutely. Active. And we got a new council, we got a new mayor. This is an opportunity to, to take that action. Take that action and Th send the right message. Thank you for being here this morning. and. Uh, Good luck on, on working on this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Stay tuned. After the break, a moment to reflect on the man we all stop to remember this weekend. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. One day right now in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. This weekend, Americans stopped to remember the life of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He not only changed America, but because he was assassinated in 1968, his values, actions, and words are frozen in our collective imagination, constantly posing questions. Like, what would Dr. King have said about this? What would Dr. King have done in this situation? I am joined now this morning by retired federal judge Nathaniel Jones, who is now a practicing attorney with Blank Rome. The judge has joined me in the past to talk about Dr. King, but some topics are worth exploring over and over again, and there are some people who are worth talking to whenever possible. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Glad and to be I, here. I, I want to, and I know I had you tell this story one other time on this show, but I want to retell it. You were at the March on Washington in 1963 I when uh, Martin Luther King made that, that speech that was probably the signature that everybody remembers him by, the I, I Have a Dream speech. Tell me about your reaction, what you were doing there, and your reaction to that speech when you heard it? Well, I was among the 250,000, 275,000 people who had gathered that day, and I was sitting on the ground <clears throat> not too far from the stage, and it was a very, very moving, very emotional, very warm event. And Dr. King was one of many speakers, um, and contrary to what people think, it was not Dr. King's march. It was a civil rights march, and Dr. King was one of the supporters and participants. But when the time came for him to speak, he launched into his, uh, into his, his speech, uh, which uh, many of us had heard on, on other occasions. And uh, it, it, uh, his style, his cadence, was such that it continued to build and build and build. And then he reached a point where he then invoked uh, his dream. And uh, Many people there knew what was coming because they had heard it before, but uh, the, the, the TV audience, the, the national audience, had not heard that. And as he, in this, before this crowd of 250, 75,000 people, uh, launched into that I Have a Dream with his tempo and his timing and his cadence and the passion and the buildup that had occurred, it was a, a very awesome moment. And I was uh, I was almost repeating it with him silently because I'd heard it a number of times, but it was uh, even so. It was dramatic, 
and uh, uh, by the time he finished, uh, the the uh, the crowd was uh, was just spellbound, and it was a very moving moment. Uh, uh, that you had uh, had the occasion to actually meet Dr. King. You yes. you had been in his presence, and yes. um, on that one-on-one -on -one basis, what you know, there's one thing: a person's public persona and their role in in society. Who was he as a person? Well, he was a very warm, very disarming person. In fact, when you were, when you were with him, you had to keep thinking to yourself, this is Dr. King, this is Dr. King. But he was so warm and um, accommodating and considerate and inquiring. He asked questions, uh, and he seemed to be interested in the questions because he would listen to your answers. And you knew he, answer, he, he listened to your questions, your answers, because he would then follow up with, uh, with, a, with a sequence of uh, uh, questions. He was always trying to absorb uh, information about the community in which he was located or about the events that were taking place, but he was a person who had a great um, respect for individuals no matter who they were. And what was so striking about him t from my standpoint was he never talked down to people. He, here's a man with tremendous academic uh, accolades, um, PhD in systemic, uh, systematic theology and uh, uh, he had been preaching since he was a boy, uh, had a command of the language, but yet he had a way of, of uh, when, he, when he was projecting ideas, of bringing people up, lifting them, and not talking down. And uh, yeah, he would talk about the Greek philosophers in a way not to be bragging, but to, to introduce you to them and, and show that many thoughts that you had, many ideas that you had, were consistent with uh, those, those great thinkers. You know, for many people, I think younger people today who only see clips on television, but even for p those of us who are alive, to, mu uh, to a large extent, Dr. King's image, memory, is frozen in 1968. Yes. And in going through getting ready for the show today, I, I found a little clip of him when he's younger, and we can see it on the screen now. Actually, he's being arrested and booked, but it was like you realized, wait a minute, he wasn't always, he didn't just burst on the stage as this fully formed person, but he was this person who grew into grew, the evolved. situation. Very Did you see that change in him? Were you close enough to see how he changed in those few years that he was on the public stage? Oh, absolutely. Um, I recall when I um, uh, first met him, it was in Columbus, Ohio, and I had the pleasure of driving him uh, to the airport. And he was, a, of course, a very young man then, and he was in the midst of the um, boycott. And we- uh, The bus boycott. Bus boycott in Montgomery. So that would have been 55. And he was a very young man, but he, even though he was very mature, he was always very mature for his age. Uh, and then I I've saw him on other occasions. Um, the most recent uh, visit I had with him was just about uh, uh, a couple of months before he was killed. And that's when I was uh, with the Kerner Commission, and I, uh, I was Deputy General Counsel. My job was to line up witnesses, and we had been pursuing him for some time to try to get him to come and testify, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. So we finally uh, prevailed upon him to come and testify. And he came, um, our report was uh, gonna be issued on Mar in March. He agreed late January to come and testify. And that's when I uh, had my last conversation with him, and, perhaps six weeks later, uh, he was uh, dead. But by that time, he had been Nobel Peace Prize winner, and he had been through the, th the, the fires of, of all kinds, and uh, he was a much more reflective person at that time. Hmm. Uh, I know during his testimony, he, his answers were not, um, uh, well, I won't say they, they, they weren't spontaneous, but he would think when members of the commission would, would pose a question, he would reflect on it and think, and it, nothing was ever black and white with him. He always saw uh, another side, and he would recognize that other side before he would advance his own uh, conclusion. And that's amazing to me. It's, it's amazing to me how young he was even when he died. Yes. It was ama it's amazing to me to think back how young he was when he came into the public view, and it's amazing to me to think about what he might have become if he hadn't been assassinated. That's true. And who he might have been today and, and where that journey would have taken him and us. So. Well, what I think is important to remember about Dr. King is that he wasn't universally acclaimed always. 
there were there were detractors. Oh yeah. And many of those today who are extolling and exalting him, uh, and I think it's justified. Many of them were uh, were in the ranks of those who condemned him for his uh, nonviolent uh, philosophy, turn the other cheek, um, his insistence on um, on America rising to its uh, to its mission. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but lots of time for us to think this weekend. Thank okay. you for being here. Sorry. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We leave you with the anthem that will forever be associated with the Civil Rights Movement and Dr. King. Have a good week. I have a dream today. We shall overcome. We shall overcome.